Hey guys, I just wanted to reach out to you and let you know that Surewinder is still selling amazing products. Some of you guys have been dragging your feet for whatever reason. If your shoulder hurts, do not waste time. Pull the trigger. I just bought uh, four or five of them and uh, we had two guys out. You know how much it cost me to pay for two guys being out with bad shoulders? We just pulled the trigger and we said, listen, everybody's going to have one on a truck. It's mandatory. You got to use it. Don't hesitate. Don't wait till your guys go down. It's going to cost you more. Buy a sure winter. What's up, guys? Ryan here at Torture Talk Podcast. Today, I'm going to do a little bit of something different. I've done something similar in the past, but we're going to address live on the show some social media posts. Yes. I'm going to read social media posts that have been posted recently in some of the garage door groups, and we're going to talk about them. So comments, whatever, uh, Randy Parker posted in garage door text. Why do we not fix it anymore? We try to replace it. You know, the parts are on the shelf at the shop. You know, I try not to like take into consideration intent but I think the mindset of fix everything or maybe not offer replacement as an option is in a way in my opinion just holding your company back and probably the client may not know all the options available to them. And so the more information they have, the more intelligent of a decision they can make. And so this mentality of like, Hey guys, why are you guys always trying to replace everything? You don't want to fix anything, whatever. Um, You know, I I want to deal with the heart issue or the lack of knowledge or whatever um, and the sarcasm that he ends this with. You know, the parts are on the shelf at the shop. And, And this is part of the issue, right? Like we all feel like our way is the right way. And obviously Randy feels like, uh, why do we not fix it anymore? We try to replace it. Um, he obviously feels like fixing everything is the right way and is, I guess, trying to promote that and fix it. Um, so just the first uh, comment, Samuel Godfrey says, it's called replace that uh, that it's still a 20 year old door upgrades from 20 years ago are better all around as they will be in another 20. I always try to repair first at the best possible given what I'm working with. Then it shows you did what you could. <laughs> uh, it will. I'm reading it as it's written. Y'all, so be, be patient with me. It will not ever last forever. So keep good relationship and the door sale will come. Quote accordingly, not a gritty brick. Ready. Not a gritty. Uh, always try to fix it. I often don't have time to replace everything I come across. Everything isn't worth the liability of it. You touch it at all. Of, of if you touch it at all, you own it. Some things are worth repairing. Others are better off replacing. It depends on condition, use, age of the budget. Age and budget. Sorry. That was my fault. So, I mean, you got, you got some pretty, you know, everybody's given some good information. Um, Derek Lyons, I don't know him. He usually gives good advice. It doesn't take much, doesn't take much for, uh, for repair, not to make sense on a 500 to 1100 motor. Why would you put 250 into a 13 year old motor when it's past half of its life expectancy? It could put that money into a new unit and not have to worry about it. I mean, he's got a point. He's got a point. Um, I'm just scrolling here. I'm 
going to try to find some juicy stuff. If you show up to a customer's house and they are drunk for their appointment, do you still do business with them or reschedule for when they're sober? I've had that happen. I just did the job. I had a drunk guy tip me $200. Bill was only 145 I'll take my chances with the drunks, <laughs> Victor. Um, let's see here. There's always good stuff in here. How profitable can it be to uh, by becoming a sub? That's a good question for, uh, from Stephen Williams. And I think the answer is like, anytime you're on full commission, it's unlimited amount of money. And I find it very interesting, right? Like, like I want to hang out here for just a second. You got, you have employees who don't want to be on commission or performance pay, right? Especially on the commercial side. Yet everybody's talking about going the sub route. Like I'm having a really hard time understanding why it's such a bad thing for there to be a comp plan that when the company wins, you win. So, so that's a bad thing. But you'll leave the company that you work for full time to go work for 100% commission with absolutely zero promises, zero, full risk. Like they slow down, they can just not use you, whatever. Like your, 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 your pay is hardly dependent on, it's very dependent on the economy, everything, where if you work for a company that has you as a W-2, they have a certain sense that like if you're a good employee, they're going to try and keep you and they may float you during that time. Um, but you're going to make as much as you want to work. And then, then, then it is like, you know, where's the balance? Uh, Brian Sigmund, uh, who I know he, he lives here near me. He's a pretty reasonable guy. Let's read his comment. It all depends on how hard you work. Are you open to learning more? Do you want to hire techs, buy trucks? Are you disciplined in all aspects, workload, financial, et cetera? There are a lot of factors to consider. I wish you the best of luck and I hope you do well. Don't be afraid to say no to some jobs. Never let anyone devalue you or your work. This includes friends. Be honest and dependable, but also firm when it comes to your business. Jump in both feet and make it happen. If you've got the uh, itch, then try to try it so you don't have to regret the wonder what if, I think he meant what if, what it uh, might could have been. No, it was what it. So so he's basically saying like, don't live in regret. If you really, if you're curious, like jump out and try it. And if it doesn't work, you know, you can probably always go get a job. So good advice, Brian. I like that advice. You know, it's better to probably do that than to live off of your employer and then do side jobs and the employer feel like you're, you know, I, I had an employee recently that I believe um, called out a lot, like a lot, a lot for long periods of time and was working on his plan B so that when he quit or when he left or we let him go, um, he would have that, he would just go do that. And um, he rode. He he rode on our bus longer than he should have, and probably manipulated me a little bit and cost me some money. So, you know, as an employer, I would say, you know, I don't. Like, if you have plans to move on, that's fine. Just come sit down and talk to me, and we'll work through them, and maybe. I can make that transition easier for you, but manipulating and, and kind of, in my opinion, in some cases, even stealing uh, probably isn't a good way to start your business. If you're going to base your business off of a funding of a company that doesn't know they're funding your startup, that's a problem. Mark Fisher. 
skip. Although that was his shortest post ever. Um, this is interesting. Mark Fisher did post this one. This is maybe his second shortest post ever. Um, how long have you been indoors and what's the longest you've worked for the same company? There's 158 comments, so I'm not going to read them all, but 33 total worked for a company learning business for five years and the owner or the owner best decision I ever made. Oh, he's been an owner for every year past five. Uh, 45 years and counting since 93, 14 years with Northern Doors and Rest Steel Craft. That's Brad. I mean, a lot of these people have been indoors for a long time. 39 years, 48 years, 41 years, 20, 30, 14, 31, 35, 31, 29 and a half, 28. Man, I just did not know there was this many. I mean, finally, like a two and a half. You and me, bro. Matthew Coolhorn, nine years, eight on my own. Jake Barely, 15 years as a summer job. Hmm. <laughs> 13, 29, 24, 37, 17, 35, 37, 7, 47, 40. Man, guys, this might be a problem. This might be a problem. 37 years, 18 years, 32 years, 38 years, 42, 32, 50, 28. Unless... Unless 45, 18, 30, 30, 29, 50, 20, 32, man, 33, 36, 22. I'm not sure I realized 42, 40, 8, 32, 15, 37, 15, 21, 22, 23, 4, 30. I don't think I realized just how many veterans we have compared to probably like newer people in the industry i think i just had like a true revelation and maybe this is not um obvious to you guys but this is kind of scary where are we going to get people all these people retiring that's scary. Quite scary. Um, someone asked if they can get them contact number Roman Troyer. Shout out Selmer, dude. Best customer service. That dude answers the phone. He's great. All right. So let's move on. GDT owners group. Because uh, a lot of the other group was a lot of just conversation about door stuff, like, which is fine. But um, so I, I want to read this one because I, I think it's interesting. So I own Diamond State Door in Delaware, which if you didn't know, Delaware is a great state to uh, register your business in, LLC or whatever. I just, and the reason why that is, is because they're very business friendly. So like if you get sued... It, they tend to lean toward the business side. I just bought a house in Fort Pierce, Florida. Door seems older, but decent shape. But operator is an old genie. I'm looking for someone close to my vacation house to install an operator for me. Hard to pack on a plane. Would prefer LiftMaster belt drive, want a keypad, and help setting my, uh, my queue since I'm 1,100 miles away. I have a manager nearby to get you in let me know who's close okay here's what's interesting because i read this earlier um let me just do all comments here just go to home depot lowe's in that area when you visit next time don't have to pack it on the plane or a company close to you might sell you what you need at cost okay this is great listen what the the post chuck bradford the guy, the OP, the original poster, replied, not looking for a deal or at cost. I read that and I stopped everything and sent him a firm request. I don't feel like doing the work 
in the limited time I get to be at vacation home, at my vacation home, see below about the time consumption. I mean, this is a guy who obviously understands the importance of his time, values his time over what needs to be done, probably was a phenomenal business owner if he's not still a business owner. I guess he is because he's the owner of the company. Has a vacation home, so obviously he's successful um, near the water in Florida, which is highly demanded. Um, so, so why wouldn't he be looking for a deal or cost? Why do you think? Why do you think he would say that? I think it's because he now understands the value of money. And how it doesn't just work one way. So I'll give you some examples. We want to make as much money on our doors as possible. But we want our suppliers not to make money at all. Some cases. Not all cases. And yes, I know they do well. And I know that you guys probably have some complaints and all this stuff. And everybody can do better. But they're probably thinking we could do better. We could do better with our professionalism. We could do better with uh, product knowledge, ordering, being demanding. Like there's so many things here that I'm I'm unpacking, right? But but I want to say that this all comes along with the same mindset that this gentleman has, Chuck Bradford. Not looking for a deal or at cost. He's willing to pay full price. He's in the garage door industry, willing to pay full price to get it done conveniently and right. And he's not the only one. There's a lot of customers out there just like that. All right, next one. Anonymous poster. I get to see who those are because I'm an admin, but I won't call them out. How long in advance? Do you allow your employees to ask off days? No, ask days off. We ask employees to give us notice of at least 30 days before. The problem is that some employees asking already now for days off in October and November to make sure they ask before other people, which is great. Like if you have a policy that says that you need to ask off for at least 30 days in advance and that you can't have off when other people are off, this is a this is a symptom of your policy, right? And you want your team to have time off. If you offer time off, you want them to have time off. Like this is great. Uh, matter of fact, let me pull something up real quick. I had um my guy's going on vacation. He got back and he just got back having the week of his life. Uh let's see here. He's at 10 grand. It's Wednesday morning. I'm recording this. That's uh, two days in the field. Five grand a day. Just got back from vacation. I would say that if you're doing it right, that's probably the results that you get. Um, so I think it's a product of your policies in this situation. So I don't know. Um, you know, for installers, you probably want like 30 days notice for service people, probably 10 business days for office people a week. Um, and I'm just kind of guessing here commercial. I would say, you know, I'd love to have 30 days. So we got, you know, got time to prepare. Um, but it's not always going to work out that way, right? Especially if it's an emergency, like you're sick or whatever. And I, I, I got to thinking about that the other day. Like, it's amazing that we almost never have people get calling sick at, at Aaron overhead doors, which is weird, but it rarely happens. Hey guys, I found something that changed my business and I want to share it with you. We've created packages that have included some of the best products in our industry to offer our service customers. 
the heart of that package is Stealth Hardware Kit. Stealth Hardware is the quietest hinges on the market. I challenge you to buy at least one of these, test it for yourself. Put it on your truck and design a quiet performance package for your customers willing to pay for a better, smoother running door. Buy your Stealth Hardware Kit at Service Spring. Do a search for Quiet Hinge and then buy that. You can buy a double or single door, seven or eight foot tall, and promise you, it'll change your service forever. Somer USA and Somer Group want to thank you for an incredible year and the trust you've put in them and their products. As you know, Somer places high value on relationships, education, customer service, innovation, and professionalism. And they are grateful to you for your part in the fostering and dissemination of these values. If there is any way Somer can support you in your journey, whether through their products, the values they hold to, or the knowledge Somer has gained through interaction with door dealers across the world, please reach out to the team at your convenience. They are here to serve you. Again, thank you from the entire Somer team. Check them out at SomerUSA.com. Tell them Ryan sent you. Commercial service agreements memberships. Curious how folks have them priced and benefits included. This is Andrew Powell. Set price with add-ons or each one currently have three options per door price add-ons available. This is an ongoing conversation in GDU. Like we're always, and I think it varies by company and like what you're trying to accomplish with your service agreements. There can be service agreements where you have a certain amount built in where they just say, hey, you have X amount of dollars allowance per door per quarter to replace parts, et cetera. You don't have to get permission. You just do it and then bill us. You can have like, you can go in with a loss leader, like something super cheap and then uh, use that, you know, as you see things and quote, 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 broken things or whatever. Um, and then this is good. So a day ago, I teach the same principle. Chris Hensington uh, is talking about menu selling. And, uh, well, Chris Hensington posted a video about Alex Hormo uh, Hormozzi uh, talking about the uh, menu selling and how the psychology of menu selling works. And you always have one uh, item that is kind of like... Um, a decoy. And so, for example, like you go to the movie theater, you order a medium popcorn. A lot of times they'll be like, oh, would you like to upgrade to a large for 50 extra cents? Right. The difference between the price between the small and the medium is big, but the difference between the medium and the large is small. And so their whole job is to get you to the large. And so he's talking about the psychology behind that. That's a good video. If you guys haven't watched that, definitely check it out. I think it's valuable. And, and how you set your prices for your Packages absolutely makes a huge difference on what people choose. If you spend 100K or more on advertising, how do you have it allocated? Ooh, this is good. Michael Rolls. I don't know if he's talking about a month, a year. Oh, somebody asked a month or a year. Um, we did just over 100K in Google and Bing last year. I'd love to be doing 100K per month, but we're not there yet. How do you guys allocate your spending? So he's talking about her K per year. So $8,000 a month. And he spent that in a couple different um, pay-per-click advertisements. And um, and for me, being a, a marketing advertising guy, I would see how much it takes for... And I'll kind of give you guys an example. Like I, I spend less than eight grand a month on pay-per-click myself. And, and I'm going to probably divulge a little bit too much information knowing that a lot of my competitors um, are on here, but they may see a lot of what I do anyway. But I have money spread out between um, Nextdoor, Facebook, Instagram, Google Ads, Bing, 
Um, Yelp. I do home shows, which is it should be part of your marketing budget, I believe, as well. So home shows. You've got. Um, we pulled out of all print for the time being just because of how expensive it's gotten over the last like year or two. We do some direct mail to like uh, we bought we buy lists so you can buy lists with contact information and target those people um, on social media, Google ads. Um, we did some billboards last year. And we spend a lot of time and effort on SEO through my marketing agency, obviously. Um, and that's really it. Our largest growing sector has been referral. Um, and on that topic, I will say... Um, word of mouth is not, is not a form of advertising, is not a form of advertising. You cannot add money to it and it grows, word of mouth. You cannot stop spending and it stops or, you know, keeps going a little bit. You're not spending any money on word of mouth maybe a little bit to help promote it with your employee, your employees or whatever, but let's be real. Like it is not a form of advertising. It is a byproduct of advertising, getting a customer, doing a good job or being cheap and getting a referral. That is what that is. That's it. All right, let's scroll through, see what we got. Um, I don't know much about prevailing wages, so I'll skip that one. Oh, yeah. Hey, one of my posts. Uh, I saw in another group that someone lost their Google business profile and 200 reviews they had earned. In most cases, a Google business profile can be recovered if you know what you're doing. If you can't, if it can't, you need your CID and you can request your reviews to be transferred to the new Google Business Profile. Not sure how helpful this is. You may already know it, but the guy didn't, uh, but that guy didn't. So I figured others may not as well. I made this photo tutorial to show you how to find your CID. And like six people liked it, three comments. Um, so I assume most people knew that and it was probably not a very helpful post, but you never know. Um, does anybody do, do, this is a good question. Does anyone do advertising through direct fairways? They print yardage signs and scorecards and advertising on it for golf courses. So I've never done that. They, they cold call a lot. Um, I did read through some of these comments and there's been some scams and then apparently this particular guy got scammed. Um, someone says, Google them, they're a scam company. Yeah, well, it's too late. I purchased one of their advertisements two years ago and I just found out this week that instead of paying $400 for two years, they have charged me three times for $978 on top of that $400 I already paid for a total of $27.94. When I called them, they wanted to give me back $400. I signed a complaint release form just doing some Googling. And it looks like they have been sued several times for the same reason. So you got to be careful with those inbound. Listen, inbound phone calls to your business for advertising, I would say probably at least 60 or 70% of them are either scams or very aggressive sales-focused marketing agencies who probably have very one-sided contracts to lock you in so you can't get out because they focused more on sales, which is not a bad thing. 
but they focus more on sales than they have retainage, right? So, so as a marketing agency, I had to make a decision. Did I want to focus on paying a bunch of salespeople to go out and grow my business really fast? Or did I want to focus my attention on, you know, doing a really good job and um, growing results month over month and trying to play the long game and, and earn the business after we get the business every single month? And we chose to do the back end because I feel like that's the best way. And, and I can honestly tell you that there are so many scams in the marketing industry. Um, and, you know, I can tell you firsthand, there's probably been six or seven garage door specific marketing agencies pop up, two or three of which aren't really garage door, maybe even more than that, aren't really garage door specific. They have like branches, I guess. Um, they've created these niches and they're presenting like their garage door focus. So they create like maybe a different name or whatever. Um, so you just got to be really careful. It's a, uh, it can be a dirty, dirty world out there. Um, there's not just scams going on in the garage door industry. It's marketing as well. Uh, anyone doing work for American Home Shield? Yes, they are being bought out and now contacting with some national door companies. That is turn just calling handyman guys in local towns to fix stuff. So asking about American Home Shield, and I, I would advise this to all of you guys, um, if they're not willing to give you a credit card on file, and pay you um, upon completion, then we don't deal with them. We just don't deal with them. So that's our take. And we've got we've got ones, and they're willing to pay five six hundred dollars for us to go in and do our stuff. Like we're six hundred and fifty dollars for a spring change. And unless you're bringing us an awful lot of work, that's our price. And some of these companies are okay paying it. And, uh, you know, you got door companies running around dropping their pants so they can get service calls. And they're out there running around doing spring changes for 200 bucks. This is another good one. Brady Olson, great question. What you, uh, you installed a door within the last year or two and a customer has a warranty complaint on the door and it's covered under manufacturer warranty. Do you still charge a labor fee to go back and fix the warranty part issue. Now, this should be something that you already have established within your organization. Your warranty as a door company is probably different than the warranty from the manufacturer. Now, if I am a homeowner, and let's say it's been two years, and then there's some delamination, delam del delamination? I don't know. Anyway, you guys understand what I'm trying to say. And I call the door company and I say, Hey, you guys uh, recommended this door. And I, you know, I need to follow a warranty because it's coming apart. I would understand if I had to pay because it's been two years and it really is not their fault, but it would feel better if they were like, you know what? Yes. You're right. We recommended this door to you. We apologize. We will make it right. And that's how they handle it. So all good. Um, but as a homeowner, I would understand if I got charged, but I wouldn't want to pay. And as a business owner, we probably wouldn't charge just because we kind of set the standard when we go out that we're only selling top-notch products and we make a lot of guarantees. And so we would want to back that up. So we probably would not charge for that. Uh, here's a good one. I'm just starting my own company and I'm currently a one-man show. Been doing doors for 20 plus years and want to make money and eventually expand, have a sellable business. So I'm not a tailgater have a sellable business. I assume he's trying to like grow his business and then sell it. Um, anyways, I have a bit of a moral dilemma. I have to work through and hopefully you guys can help me out. I've been asked for a quote for a re-re of two nine by eights and one 16 by AMR Vista 1000. Would this 
with the possibility of replacing openers also. So he's got a quote for two doors, two motors, Amar Vista. Currently, I work out of my I work out my door prices with a 1.6 multiplier. Makes the math simple on my end. With installation, it usually works out to be around 40 to 50 percent margins. When quoting these doors, they aren't cheap doors. Should I stick with my 1.6 multiplier and install rates 40 percent margin, or should I drop it a bit and be happy with a five to seven k for a day's work? So, this is the flexibility that a one-man show has and probably one of the advantages that a one-man show has as a startup i know i'm gonna get a lot of backlash from this you take the money but i think you try to go for your standard margin first and potentially like i don't think um 1.6 multiplier turns out to be 40 percent margin across the board because the more expensive you get on these doors um, the margin will go down. So let's say, for example, and, and I've taught this before, but we're going to go through it again. Let's say, for example, he's doing a um, two doors, two motors, um, pan doors, similar setup, right? And the cost of everything is three grand. That's one point times 1.6 multiplier. He, he would be at $4,800. Um, so 3000 dollars divided by 0. 0.6 would be five thousand dollars so at 40 percent margin he he was never at 40 percent margin to begin with at 1.6 multiplier he wasn't i don't care what he thinks he was at uh significantly less half of that because um well hang on one second three thousand by about 0.6 is 5,000. 3,000 times 1.6 multiplier is 4,800. So he was a little under 40%. He was probably 38, okay? So, but he thinks he's between 40 and 45% on 1.6 multiplier, a $3,000 job. Now, um, he's now thinking if he does two Vistas, and two operators. Let's say that's going to cost him 10 grand. All right. Because we're talking, he he said 40% margin should put around uh, or just be good with five to seven K. We're going to use 10 grand because it's a round number. $10,000, 1.6 multiplier, $16,000. So $6,000 profit. All right. That same $10,000 at 40% is 16,666. So not far off, um, $666. You keep doing that though, and you build your business and you're going to have to understand that one of the numbers that you have to watch carefully as you grow your overhead, you get a warehouse, you got truck payments, you got all this stuff. Um, you have to maintain, you know, 45, 50, 55% gross profit numbers. And depending on your overhead, and what you're doing and doing a multiplier of 1.6 is not going to cover you. This may work for him, but let's think about this. If he lost $666 in profit, what could he have done with that? Well, $666, I'm getting uh, $8 a click right now on my paper click uh, divided by eight is 83 clicks. We took that and did a 10% conversion rate. That'd be eight, eight uh, leads. If we just closed half of those, that's four jobs. Our average, I'm just using my math, sorry, because I don't have his. Our average, closed average sale um, yesterday or this week is 2708. That's $10,832. Guys, it's not just $666. It's not, especially as a startup or a one-man show. Like, this is your growth money. If, if, if you give that growth money up, you're giving up the growth that it creates. So the $600 that you're losing out on, 666, which probably a bad number to go with, but 666 could turn into 10 grand. But you wouldn't know that 
because you gave it up. Man, this lesson right here. Holy cow. Colin Partridge. I'm going to probably tag you when I do this because I truly believe that that was a message that everybody needed to hear and understand that every dollar counts, especially in growth mode when you're really small, like it even counts more. Um, you know what? We're going to wrap it up. We're going to wrap it up. I feel like we did a good job today. This is good information. I think you guys um, get the point, like, and I've enjoyed doing this. So we'll wrap it up. I hope you guys like this show. It's just me going through kind of like instead of commenting on all these posts, just sharing with you, our audience, Torsion Talk, the fam, my thoughts on some of these posts and where I come from on them. And uh, hopefully it challenges some of your thinking and provides alternate views that you can wrestle with while you're in your truck or sitting in your office. And maybe you agree, maybe you don't agree, but regardless, I think it's valuable to listen and hear other perspectives, bounce them off of your, your own. And as I tell my team, put it through a filter see if it's healthy, see if it's safe, see if it's interesting, see if it's beneficial, and then wrestle with it however you want. So I hope that was helpful. See you guys in Vegas. Be blessed.